So, three guesses why I played that. Nostalgia. Nostalgia, that's good. Oh, you know what? I once wished that I was. I even had the action figure. One more? Okay, I'll give the third one. The third one is that this was my intro into tech. When I was about, ooh, maybe eight, I got my first action figure and it was the Six Million Dollar Man. So that got me to thinking, okay, how am I able to hold this piece of action figure to my eye and like see through further than what I would be normally able to see if I wasn't looking through it. So it got me thinking, what are these types of things like lenses and things like binoculars? Where did they all come from? And fast forward to high school, I decided to start to pick classes that would help me answer some of these questions. So one of the classes that I had that was really impactful for me was called World of Construction. Everybody say, ooh, World of Construction. So yeah, that was the very first foray into technology. So some of the things that uh, this particular class introduced me to was circuitry, AC and DC currents. How do those operate? How do they differ? What makes them unique? And also, what are the advantages and disadvantages of those? Another thing was construction technology. We had two very different uh, sequences. We had things that were more along the technological line and things that were more along the industrial line. So the technological line had to do with all of the things that go into making something work. The industrial aspect was, hey, you get out there and build something and make it work. So this is where the construction technology aspect came into, into being. We learned about two different types of uh, construction. We have balloon frame and we have platform frame. The reason why I bring that up is because the Chicago fire had very important implications for those two types of construction uh, methods. Balloon framing was a lot of what was used before the Chicago fire. And everybody thought it was Miss O'Leary's cow who started the fire. But no, it was more than that. It was because we had a lot of construction in the city that had to do with balloon framing. And all balloon framing, framing did was run up a whole bunch of two by four studding without any type of fire breaks. So basically what happened was when the fire started, the hot air turned the house into a hot air balloon and up it went. Kaboom, no more house. So they figured that out and they were like, okay, hmm, let's see what we can do. So if we put platforms at certain heights and then at certain sides of those heights put in fire breaks. Section of construction members a certain way that will divert the fire from going straight up and maybe make the fire go outward as opposed to upward. So platform frame construction helped us to mitigate fires. We learned that. At the end of that sequence, we actually had to build a house not a full-scale house, because we were in a schoolhouse, so we couldn't build a full-scale house. So we, we did something very important. We learned how to do things to scale. So when we learned to do this, what we were able to do was say, okay, how can we build this house in this space? So for every one foot, let's try to dial that down and make it so that that foot is more like an inch, a quarter of an inch, and so forth. So we ended up using a scale that was a quarter of an inch. Every one quarter of an inch was a foot. And that's how we were able to build our model houses. 
And we had to figure this out all by ourselves. So we're sitting there scratching our heads, a bunch of 14, 15 year olds trying to see how we could actually build a house that was in a room of a house. So weird stuff. But fast forward again, uh, this led me to Daily College and I started my adventure into deeper levels of construction. So I did construction technology. We learned about the different types of construction methods, whether it be brick, concrete, masonry basically, whether it be steel or whether it be composites of steel. And we learned about modulus of elasticity, big word, right? We learned about the compression strength of steel, which is 29,000 pounds per square inch. I still remember that today. My teacher would be impressed. But uh, all of that was very fun. And uh, I went on to do very well. Went on to design school and joined the military. I was like, hmm, let's go find something else fun to do. But I had always wanted to travel the world and see different things. And so what better way to do it than on somebody else's dime. And who's better dime to do it on than good old Uncle Sam, because he's got a lot of money. So that's what I did. I joined the military, went overseas, served in Germany, where I learned that the McDonald's that's in the US, it's not the same as the McDonald's that's in Germany. So I go there and I order a Big Mac. Big Mac didn't taste like a Big Mac. The special sauce was not the special sauce. I don't know what that special sauce over there was, but it wasn't, I don't know, maybe it was the meat. Maybe it was the meat that made the special sauce taste not like the special sauce. But anyway, you learn different types of nuances when you're in a different culture and you're trying to live like an American in that culture. And so, what I basically was able to do was get used to eating their food and not try to duplicate my eating habits developed here and transport it over there. That didn't work very well. So I was like, okay, we'll get used to eating schnitzels and bratwurst and good stuff like that, which was, took a little bit of getting used to, but eventually you can basically suck down a few beers and pretty much be able to palletize anything. So it, it actually ended up being where you found better places to eat the food, and so you didn't have to drink as much. Because <laughs> food costs less than beer, so you know, you want to kind of save money at some point. But uh, to get into the technological part of my military career, would be to say that we had to take on different types of jobs within our job skill. So when I went to, to a military or occupational specialty school, my main concentration was logistics and transportation. Don't ask me why I didn't do construction, because they didn't want me to do heavy construction. They wanted me to do light construction. And the difference between that is the technology in light construction teaches you to blow things up. The technology in heavy construction teaches you to build things up. I was like, no, I think I'd rather build things up. So if you're not gonna let me go to school to build things up, I don't wanna go to school to blow things up. Because blowing things up is fun to watch, not fun to do. Pretty much because it's dangerous. If you set the fuse at the wrong time or you set the timer and don't get out of the way at the wrong time, kaboom, you go up with whatever you're gonna blow up. So that wasn't fun. I didn't think so at least, but anyway. Um, did transportation management at Fort Eustace, Virginia. Did logistics management at Fort Lee, Virginia. And then we got caught up for Desert Storm. This was back in 1991. So went back to Germany, stayed there for 90 days, um, at which point we had to basically ship 
60,000 containers, 240,000 pallet loads, and then track it from where it came from to where it had to get, go to. Why? Because the military wanted to do something new. It was called In Transit Visibility, ITV, which means the generals want to see things moving where they're supposed to go so they can feel good about telling them, hey, those are my troops doing that. So ITV involved you sitting at a computer, putting something on a ship, making sure that that ship got loaded and was sent to its port of call within a certain time period and then reporting that back. And how did we do this? We had something called LogMars. LogMars is a logistics management information recovery system. So you put these like pods on each container and you ship it across the ocean. Now, here is a catch. Weather changes constantly by sea, more so than by, by air or by land. Not to mention the fact that you're going from Germany in January when it's probably zero degrees below zero at some point, and then you're going into Saudi Arabia or the port of Aqaba or Ashueba, somewhere in there in, in, in the Gulf, and you have to make sure that you harden these particular transportation information systems. So basically you had to make them weatherproof at, or as close as possible in order to get them across. So it took us the capacity of building a hard shell around very intricate tracking devices. And sometimes we had to figure it out for ourselves. Other times we had help from civilian contractors who had new stuff that was coming on the market in the civilian world. And they were able to help us do it. But we were able to track all of our containers and all of our pallet loads and get them overseas. Hooray for us. So when we go to war and you wonder why we're able to kick so much behind, it's because of one reason. We're able to get things to where they need to be when the people who need it need to have it. That's critical. If we can't do that, we don't win. And so that's how we're able, logistics is why we're able to win wars, because our logistical supply chain in the military is unmatched as far as any other military is concerned. Other countries in the NATO forces come to us to transport some of their stuff. So that being said, when we're in the field and we have to communicate, we have several different types of methods. We have field phones that we communicate with. We have tactical phones that we communicate with, but also we have radio frequency ways of communicating. So we have something called radio frequency tags, and you all have seen these, because if you look at any type of a uh, container truck, and you see these long plastic things hanging all on them, looped over by a zip tie or something like that, that's an RF tag. That particular device contains all of the information that's within that container. So we load these things up in a computer just like this, a laptop. We take it up to the RF tagging station. We plug it in and we load up everything that's in there. And we tag it and, we, and, it, and it gets shipped. So that being said, logistics, once again, is the lifeblood of what we do in the military. If it wasn't for logistics, the military would not function as it does. And it if it wasn't for technology, logistics wouldn't function as it does. So some of the important devices that we use are being used now in the civilian sector. So all of these concepts about how FedEx does shipping, how UPS does shipping, 
all of that was born out of military technology that was being done in the 70s and 80s. Fast forward 25, 30, 40 years to now, we are now able to, anybody can track a package, right? Any of you, if you had a FedEx shipment and you wanted to find out where it was or why you didn't get it to where it needed to get to, you have a tracking device or a tracking number. You can go online, put in that tracking number, and find out where your package is. Why didn't it get to me? Why didn't it get to dear old Uncle Bob when he needed it most? Now he's pissed at me. I don't know where his package is. So you can type in that tracking number and find that package, right? That came out of technological advances that we were at the forefront of during the Gulf War. So why is that important to us in today's day and age? Anybody ever heard of Amazon? Everybody buys off of Amazon. Nobody goes to an Amazon store, at least not yet, right? Who knows, that might happen. They're doing everything else. So you go to Amazon and you pick something online, you pay for it, and it gets shipped to you. So think about it like this. If a soldier is in the battlefield and they need whatever to get to them, they are able to communicate back to their hire, their base, and tell them, hey, we need 40 containers of beans, 50 containers of bullets, ASAP, as in yesterday. So all of that is being tracked. All of that is being fed back to a general clearinghouse of information. And that's what communication is all about, is about getting that information and using it for the benefit of those who need it. So fast forward basically to my civilian transition. Everybody in the military to me was a client. And so the transition from the military to, to, to back to civilian life was basically the same. Everybody to me is a client. How can I be of service? That's the first thing that a military person knows how to do. They know how to be of service. So when I had the opportunity to do this, I jumped at it. When I had the opportunity to uh, join with Leave No Veteran Behind and join with two other people that I had grew up with, that was a bonus. I couldn't turn it down. So they were like, hey, we know a logistics guy. We need him to help us formulate a plan to present to the city of Chicago for safe passage. And so this whole concept of people standing on street corners with radios, communicating with each other and communicating with the police, that was our concept. Back in 2010, the uh, c city of Chicago, through the Chicago Public School Systems, put out what they call a RFP, a, re a request for proposal. And they were like, we need people to fulfill this particular arrangement. It was part of what was known as the Culture of Calm Initiative. So we were like, oh yeah, we're the group for this. So we came up with this big idea that we would be able to put veterans out there to interact with young people, be role models, be mentors, be people they can be a sounding board to. We didn't want to make it look as if to say, you have to go tell on your buddy to the safe passage guy. That was not what we wanted to do. We wanted to create an atmosphere of a relationship between a veteran and a youth. And so the youth engagement, the veteran youth engagement uh, uh, program was born out of that. So our approach was different. We took a very soft approach. We were not the cops. We didn't want to be the cops. We wanted to be the people who would be there so there wouldn't be any cops. And so how do we want to do this? First of all, we wanted to use two-way radios 
that were powerful enough to reach back to any type of help that we would need uh, at the schoolyard. But we also wanted to have uh, body cameras. That was a concept of ours back about eight years ago now. We wanted to wear body cameras. We wanted to be on the buses. We wanted to have uh, radio telephones. But we also wanted to be able to integrate with the school's body, the school's, uh, their principals, their uh, youth counselors, their um, career counselors, because we just didn't want to be there making sure that the children got home safely. We also wanted to be there as a sounding board, as I said before, as a way of showing them, hey, there are options out here that we know about that we can introduce you to, and then you, we can, in coordination with your counselors, can help you decide what you want to do in life. And so that whole idea of the safe passage was something that we wanted to do bigger than what it was done. So when we pr presented the proposal, they were like, okay, this is nice, this is nice, you can't do that, you can't do that, you can't do that. So it got watered down to what you see today. But the bottom line is we didn't quit because when the opportunity came for us to re-engage with the city, we took advantage of that. We were a, one of the first groups that was part of the uh, One Summer Chicago program. So we worked with youth during the summer for eight weeks at a time at two high schools. Uh, each high school had 30 youth. We brought in 15 total veterans for both schools. We worked with the, the city's Green Corps Department and we worked with, uh, the, uh, with CDOT and we work with the Department of Family Support Services. The two things that we wanted the children to learn was that there were skills that could make you a whole lot of money where you didn't have to go to college and you were responsible socially to you, your community and your environment. So those two job skills were gardening and biking. But we didn't just stop there. We were like, biking isn't enough we're going to show them how to build a bike, that bike. So that bike you see there came out of a 1972 Schwinn frame. We went to a biking mechanic. How many of you have ever heard of bubbly dynamics? How many of you know that bubbly dynamics hosts one person who has a company called Pedal to the People. Okay, that was a far reach. I thought you wouldn't know him. But you got to get to know this guy because Adam is a great bike builder. He's the best bike builder I know and I know quite a few of them. But he took a 1972 Schwinn frame and basically what they called, I guess, what would you call it? What, what do they call it when they pimped my ride, right? He pimped our bike. That's a frame that was about to get rusted, that was about to get thrown away. We were like, no, this is not going in the garbage. So this is, to us, the perfect example of what we know as upcycling. No pun intended. So we took that cycle frame and we turned it into something that the kids could ride but at the same time charge their cell phones on it because that spoke that's on that bike, if you pedal fast enough, generates enough electricity where it's, it's going to power your cell phone. We have a cell phone hub on here that you can use a USB port for and it will charge your cell phone while you bike. Unfortunately, we were not able to keep this program uh, the place that the program was being hosted, which is my home church, Windsor Park Lutheran Church on 2619 East 76th Street. I give you all that information because one day I want you to come visit. Hint, hint. So we could not keep the program there and we had to relocate it to the high schools of the young people because it was, 
in the infinite wisdom of the Chicago Public Schools that the students would be better off learning these skills in their schools, which, will, which would get them more familiar with and more comfortable with being at school because they wanted to reduce the level of truancy, I guess is, would be the word. So they wanted to have more things in the schools where the children could feel more compelled or more at home or more comfortable at all times. So all of these programs got relocated to their schools. But there is no quit in Leave No Veteran Behind. So when the programming got relocated, all we did was take an aspect of what we did and created something called STEAM Core. So STEAM Core stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Arts, and Math Cooperative. So STEAM Core is now being done at Len Blom High School. So we said, if you want to take this out of the community and put it into a high school, fine, we'll go to a high school and still do what we're doing, no matter what. So if you get a chance to, um, just Google LNVB STEAM Core, and uh, you'll be able to get more information on what we've done and what we're doing uh, at those schools. We also have a opportunity to uh, engage with our church in a different way now through Leave No Veteran Behind Partnership. So one of the things we were able to do at Windsor Park was develop this idea of the church being a community hub. So back in 2013, Windsor Park turned 100 years old. And the uh, prevailing theme was that the church would now become a different way of serving. Not only do we have people come into the church and have service or get services rendered to them, but now the church goes out and does more outreach. So the biggest thing that we saw that the church could help with was the fact that there wasn't enough access to the internet in the South Shore area. And so what happened was that we developed a partnership between Leave No Veteran Behind, Cambium Networks, and Windsor Park to devise a Wi-Fi hub. I think I'm going to need some technical assistance. Spacebar, thank you. That always works. So there's Rob. He's uh, the co-founder or the co-director formerly of Steam Core. That's the hub I was telling you about. That particular hub does magic, if you can pedal fast enough. There's one of the students test riding it after we had built it. And now, this is another uh, aspect that I'm going to talk about before we get to the uh, Leave No Veteran Behind uh, and Cambium Partnership. So when we did the, the last programming for the, for the young people, we did a silent auction where we had the bike, we had several different electronics devices that the young people had refurbished and had also did some things with as far as uh, artistically. Because, I mean, we didn't just want to do STEM. We wanted to do STEAM. So if we were doing STEAM, then that A, which is for arts, the kids had to show up their artistic uh, capacity. So they did some weird stuff with uh, microphones. They did some weird stuff with amplifiers. They did some weird stuff with tables and bikes. And we had a silent auction. It was fun. They sold most of it, but we couldn't sell the bike. We didn't sell the bike. We still have the bike, but that's OK, because that was just our prototype. We plan on building two other kinds of bikes sometime in the near future, so stay tuned. So that closes the books on the, the STEAM Core partnership that we're currently uh, involved with. And so fast forward to 
two years ago now where we had a partnership with Cambium Networks. And so what you see there at the very top of that roof, or what would be a parapet off the roof, is the antenna. And that particular antenna gets its signal from another antenna that's on the uh, top of the M Museum of Science and Industry. So when you're driving along Lakeshore Drive and you look, try not to look while you're driving, but when you look over to the museum and look high up, you'll see that there are antennas up there. One of those antennas belong to a company called American Wide Broadband. They are the internet provider who now services the antenna that feeds into Windsor Park's Wi-Fi hub uh, station. So we're able to basically provide Wi-Fi to everybody in the neighborhood that's within a four square block or so radius. We are also able to do this because we have a partnership with a restaurant owner who was very gracious enough to have us put a repeater on his roof to extend the Wi-Fi capacity. So if you go close enough to Windsor Park and you dial up the uh, ISP and you put in a certain frequency, I believe it begins with like 837. I don't know the rest of it, so don't quiz me on it. But if you dial that up and you put in those numbers, you'll be able to feed into Windsor Park's Wi-Fi hub. And this is just the foray of what we're going to get into as far as the uh, internet hub is concerned. Because we just don't think that we've done enough. Again, we're trying to bridge this divide where people who do not have internet capability can attain internet capability. So let's talk a little bit about Cambium because this is their mission also. They've gone all over the world to do this for countries that before were very, very uh, deprived of internet capacity. They've been as far, as far as I know, as far south uh, east as Sri Lanka. They've been to uh, several African countries, including Ghana and uh, Zim Zimbabwe. And they've done work all over the world. And one day, one of their uh, directors, who's also a veteran, Mr. Ray Savage, he's a Navy veteran, I'm not gonna hold that against him, met with one of our co-founders for Leave No Veteran Behind, Mr. Eli Williamson, and they were like, we're doing all this stuff all over the world, yet we have the same type of third world situations right here in our inner cities. Wouldn't it be nice if we were able to do some of these same things right here in our inner cities where they are just as disconnected from the internet as those people in those third world countries? And they both were like, hmm. And Eli was like, yeah, actually, I know where you could do it. You could do it at my church. So Ray was like, okay, I think we can make that happen. So two years ago, the unveiling of the Windsor Park uh, Wi-Fi hub was done. We had something called a wire cutting ceremony. <laughs> that was the very first and last I've been to, but there will be more. Not exactly the same, but very much in the same vein. So some of the things that we're looking to do, one is to create a internet cafe. We're going to take several days out of the week, maybe two to three hours a day, and have people come in and just do internet stuff. Maybe they'll do some coding. Maybe they'll do some hackathons. Maybe they'll just sit there and surf the net for two hours. But the bottom line is they're going to be able to do things that right now 
because of the fact that there is this divide between them and accessibility to being able to have those what I consider necessary implements in our technological society, they'll be able to come to the church and do that. And uh, I think we will all be the better for it because it takes your mind away from your daily whatever. And some of these daily whatevers that I'm talking about lead to things that are not good that we hear on the 10 o'clock news, that we hear in newspapers around the world about how Chicago is, I don't know, the murder capital of the world or whatever is the latest that I've been hearing lately. Chirac is another thing I hear a lot from the kids. So all of those different types of identifying uh, ways of looking at Chicago, we are trying to change. And South Shore, being a microcosm of all this, is a good location for us to be able to make that kind of impact. So that being said, our next venture will include all of the different partners we just spoke of, but also hopefully bring in some more heavy hitters. So we're looking to bring in people like maybe Microsoft, people like, oh, I don't know, maybe Motorola, maybe Amazon. The sky's the limit because as far as technology is concerned, if you bridge that divide, everybody now becomes accessible and you in turn become accessible to everyone. And that's the basic concept, is that when you're trying to break a divide, you make it so that you build a bridge that the toll is equal both ways. So that means I'm not spending more asset to get to you than you're spending to get to me. Right now, that's the way it is. The assets that are being asked for from people who are of lesser means is greater than the assets that are being asked for from people with greater means. And so part of breaking that digital divide is to make the asset allocation equal so that everybody can afford, there's, it's a question of, of, of affordability, so that everybody can afford to gain access to that technological edge that we all need in the 21st century. So at this time, what I would like to do is just a quick recap. So talking from where I'm standing, I would just like to say thank you for your time. I would like to say thank you to Steve. I'd like to say thank you to Denise and about what, two years ago now when we sat in the uh, Blue Room at Windsor Park and said, well, what are we gonna do? Okay, let's do a, a community technology forum. I had no idea what would spin off from that. But now, oh, and, and I recognize Nathan in the back there. He's, he's gonna be one of our, our, our partners coming up. He's shaking his head, yes you are. <laughs> so uh, eventually, when we get this partnership going, it will be a, both a grassroots and a technology cooperative that's gonna come together. And people all over the city, all over the country, will look at this as a model that they can also implement. Because our co-founders, Mr. Eli Williamson and Mr. Roy Sarton, they don't rest. They're up and down this country, up and down this globe, basically, finding out new ideas, searching out new partnerships, and trying to make it so that that digital divide gets bridged. I would like to say thank you for your time 
Thank you for your interest. I hope I didn't bore you to tears. And if you have any questions, I will take them now. Is there uh, AT&T or Comcast Wi-Fi coverage in Windsor Park area? The question was, is there AT&T or Comcast Wi-Fi coverage in our area? The answer is yes. But I say that with hesitation because the quality of the internet as far as Comcast or AT&T are concerned, are not that great, to say the least. I'm, I'm being nice. Uh, but also, the cost. It can get very expensive. The, uh, the average cost for internet, I would say, for Comcast, for example, is probably like 65 to $70 a month. For AT&T, it's more than that. It's probably more like 80 to $90 a month. And a lot of people can't afford that, to be honest with you. And so it's, it's, uh, it's a hindrance in two ways. One, it's not as uh, regular. And two, it's, it can be costly. So uh, currently, you need to be what, come into the church to use the computers at the church or go to the rest of the cafe that's uh it's there, uh, or can you just connect, if you've got a house in that four block radius, can you just connect to the Wi-Fi from that? Yes, uh, you actually can connect. Because what I've actually seen with my own eyes is people driving up and just stopping in front of the church, and then all of a sudden they get out their phone. Or people walking by the church and sitting on the stoop, getting out their phone. And actually one person, when I walked out the church one day, was sitting on the stoop and I was like, hi, how you doing? She was like, oh, I'm fine, I'm just stealing your internet. I'm like, okay, that's fine. And I just went on by my business and she sat there and did what she did. There's a question in the document. What was the name of the restaurant that allowed for the receiver on the rooftop? Rainbow Sub Shop. And I want to thank Julio, the owner. And by the way, Julio is an Army veteran. So what are the chances? Um, I'm curious, uh, the like, veteran support and involvement combined with the youth mentorship is interesting. And I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about if, if there's any like cross-pollination between young people and veterans specifically about technology or working on these things? Because uh, I feel like young people are growing up with these things that you know the rest of us were exposed to when we were already older. And that, and as well as like the social component too, like you mentioned how some young people refer to Chicago as Chirac, and I, I wonder what sort of dialogue is sparked with like a veteran who's actually been in Iraq. Two-part question. So I'll take the first part and uh, say this. So the genesis of Steam Corps was this very thing, was to take that whole aspect of technology and take a group of professionals who were at the cutting edge of this country's technological advancements, bring them into a situation with youth who are on another side on the cutting edge of technology because they see it. They, uh, at some level, take advantage of it. But then there is an aspect of technology that is completely foreign to them, that is basically a barrier for them to get through. And that aspect is actually being able to provide technology, being able to be the person who works in a technologically uh, uh, oriented field. That isn't open to our young people on the south side of Chicago or, or in many of our uh, underserved neighborhoods. So that is the aspect that we devised Steam Core to be able to bridge the gap on was to introduce these young people to that aspect of technology which allows them to see 
hey, that's a job. That's a job that pays six figures. That's a job that pays six figures where I don't have to go to college and get a whole bunch of debt. That's a job where I can go to uh, Microsoft, get the proper certifications, and go work in the field. And again, I ain't got no college debt. So that's the aspect that we're trying to get them to see with Steam Corps. And that's the aspect that uh, right now we're actually trying to uh, develop that into more Chicago public schools. And it's at Lindblom Technical High School at this moment. And the second part about Chirac and those of us who have gone there, and I didn't touch on this uh, when I was talking, but I'm a veteran of four war zones. The first one was Desert Storm. The second one was Bosnia and Kosovo. And then the fourth one was Afghanistan. So I was in Afghanistan from uh, the early part of, or the late part of 2002 into the middle to late part of 2003. So I was part of a uh, combined joint task force. And what a combined joint task force does is they work both the uh, uh, psychological and uh, clandestine warfare, but also at the same time work the conventional warfare aspect. And our job was the LTF. The LTF was the logistical task force. We were there to supply the, uh, the beans and the bullets and the bedding for both aspects of the operation. We had everybody from the CIA, the NSA, and the special forces from uh, various countries that we were clients, that, that were our clients. And again, the way I look at it is I'm, I was in the military to, to provide a service. So all of those different armies, all of those different special forces groups were my clients. And uh, Maybe one day if you all come over to Windsor Park, hint, hint, I'll show you my NSA coin. But uh, bottom line being that when these young people talk about a war zone, we try to tell them, we were like, this is a war zone of a different kind. We understand that. But when you really think about it, this is your life that you really have to look at from that perspective. And so when we were in Iraq, Afghanistan, where have you, that was not really our life. So we didn't have an opportunity to really live that particular scenario, but they did. And so if you have a chance to live something, guess what? You have the free will to try to change that dynamic. You have the, the opportunity to change the narrative. You have that power. So we try to tell them that you have that power to change that narrative. For us, it was just 180 or 270 or 365 days in the suck. And after the suck, we came home. So that was the difference we tried to explain to them that we were in the combat zone, and we just did what we could do to keep ourselves and our buddies alive. But they had the power to do more than that. And I think that's what they didn't feel they had the power to do. Thank you. Thank you.